This excerpt was taken from the Full and Bloom interview with Badlands bassist Greg Chasen. Inside the album, Badlands 1989 self-titled album. You can listen to the entire interview at fullandbloom.com. With the audition process, I know you meet Jake during the Ozzy auditions, but he actually calls you to come audition? Yeah, him and I stayed in contact while um, he was in Ozzy and he would call me from the road and we'd have some time off in town. He'd come over and my wife would cook dinner and uh, just kind of hang out. We kind of we had a friendship going. And so when he left Ozzy, he'd always told me when I leave, leave Ozzy, we'll do something. So I assumed when he left Ozzy, I was just going to be in whatever his band was going to be called. Well, then he wanted me to audition for it. And I was kind of caught off guard and I thought, man, if I audition and I don't get the gig, I'm going to look like an idiot because all my friends know that I know Jake and that, you know, I had said, yeah, someday Jake and I are going to be in this band. So I just didn't want to audition. So what I told him is audition everyone that you can. And if you don't find anyone, I'll come in and audition. And so we went through that process two or three times. And then finally, at the end of it, you know, I ended up getting the gig. Now, I kind of figured out the reason that he did that is because he didn't, everyone knew we were friends and he didn't want me to get the gig just because we didn't want people saying I only got the gig because he and I were friends. And people said that anyway. But he wanted to be where I went in and proved that I was the guy for the for the job, whatever. So... In the end, it worked out great, and I'm glad that I auditioned, and the experience was really interesting, and uh, um, I wouldn't change it, that's for sure. Does he already kind of have a deal set in place, or, nope. or what's that? No, he did not. Okay, so you guys formed the band, and I can't even remember. I was thinking um, the last Ozzy record he did it was um, like 86 or something, and then he toured, and so there was like a year or two break in there. Is that correct? I I think that probably when he was out of Ozzy by maybe the spring of 87 or early summer, and then he didn't do anything till sometime in 88. So I, I, I want to say that he took almost a year off. I could be wrong. Um, what happened was he just took some time and he, you know, he had some money and he had his, had his daughter, Jade. So he was kind of just doing that. And uh, anyone knows Jake, he doesn't make any snap decisions. I think he just sat there and pondered on what he wanted to do. And, and I was around him quite a bit then. And so, you know, I would come over and we'd go to lunch or I'd come over, he'd play me a riff that he was working on, you know, for this, unnamed uh, mystery project that he was going to do. And I wasn't saying, hey, am I going to be in your band? I was just kind of playing it cool, waiting to see what was going to happen. And then um, he decided to, uh, well, Ray Gillen called him and Jake didn't return his call. So Ray Gillen's mother called Jake and said, hey, you need to uh, have my son come out there. He's a great singer. And he really wants to play with you and you need to make this happen. And <laughs> so Jake, you know, who was just kind of, going at his own speed, said, well, if I got someone's mom pissed off at me, I guess I better bring him out. <laughs> so he brought Ray and then Eric, and the three of them played together without a bass player. And Jake really liked it. And uh, Jake and I uh, were going out to see BC Rich. For, uh, they want, they were, I was already with BC Rich, but they were trying to woo Jake over. So they sent a limo to Jake's house, and they drove us the 60 miles out to the middle of the high desert where BC Rich was at. And in, in the car on the way there, he played me the rehearsal tape that he'd made with Eric and uh, Ray. And he uh, he said, you want to hear this singer? And I said, yeah, sure. And obviously, it was great because it was Ray. And Ray was just making up lyrics on the spot on just riffs that Jake was making up. But in the interim of listening to that, I said, you know, Ray's really great, but you ought to, you should think about keeping this drummer. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm thinking, of, you know, I like him too. And that was Eric. So that's when, you know, he had those two guys already in tow. And that's when he said, do you want to audition? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> Weird on my part. I mean, he auditioned like 40 different guys, and a lot of them were guys that were in bands and named guys. But I think, you know, Jake and I had played together in Scotland, and Jake's way of playing, he just comes in and starts jamming on a riff. And he doesn't come in with a song, it's just a jam, and then you just jam around for 45 minutes on the same kind of riff where you're changing tempos and changing keys and changing directions. And Jake's very well versed. He can go from metal to blues to country to ragtime to folk, to jazz, and everything in between, river dance, all at the same time. And you got to have enough on the ball to be able to kind of figure out what he's doing and to make it interesting. And so a lot of Badlands songs are written that way, um, with him just coming in with a riff, and then Ray would like it or we would like it. And so 
you know, that whole first record is pretty much done that way. And, um, you know, it, it, it was a very interesting uh, way of doing it. But you don't really have any songwriting credits on that first record, do you? Yeah, well, there's a whole story on that. Uh, um, Jake and Ray were going to write all those songs themselves. So even if you contributed anything, the way the manager wanted it was going to be all Jake and Ray. And I was fine with that. I didn't care. I mean, I would throw in a bit or a bobble here and there, and, and I wasn't coming in with whole parts or anything like that. I would suggest ideas the same anyone else would. And I don't know whether any of them would be warranting, warranted a songwriting credit, but I wasn't concerned about it. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I didn't bring in any complete songs or riffs. Jake had plenty of stuff. I liked the way he wrote. It was never an issue for me. I got, I got paid good, and I was having a good time in the best band that I've ever been in with best player I saw. Yeah. I love his work with Ozzy more than I um even the Randy Rhodes work. And I love Randy Rhodes, but there's just always been something about Jake's playing and his solos and he's just uh seems like um the real deal. Even personality wise, he seems like just a good guy. He's a good guy. He's the most versatile guitar player that I've ever met and I would not hesitate to say the most versatile one Ozzy's ever played with. Um he's my favorite of the Ozzy guitar players. Um not that I don't like Randy, I do, not that I don't like Zach, I do. Um, but Jake just has a completely different way of doing things, and he's a brilliant rhythm player. I mean, he's a, just a brilliant rhythm player. And, uh, you know, I like the material that Jake brought into, you know, Ozzy. Those two records are my favorite ones because they're the most varied of uh, of the ones. I mean, Randy's stuff is cool because it has more of a classical influence to it. Yeah. But Jake's has a lot of different things, modal things, and different whole ways of doing stuff. I'm assuming Badlands was an equal split amongst all the members, or you weren't just a hired gun, right? No, but I, I, I don't think it was an equal. I think Jake would have got more publishing, and so would Ray. But... Um, but as far as money. gigs and stuff like that, or or was that not? Uh... Well, we got, we got the publishing advance. Um, you know, Jake and Ray could have cut the lion's share, but they decided to put it back into the band so that the whole time I was in the band, I got paid. And we got a pretty healthy publishing advance. And so I never really spent any time worrying about the songwriting aspect of it because I was getting paid. And when Voodoo Highway was going to come out, I knew I was going to submit some material for that. I was writing stuff, which I did uh, for Voodoo Highway. So it wasn't an issue to me. I, I never got into this for the money. I mean, I, obviously, you got to get paid to keep going. But I never cared about being a millionaire versus a hundred air. And I didn't do it to be a rock star. I did it because I wanted to be in a great band that people thought was a great band with great players. That's what I wanted. I wanted the respect that you get from that. I mean, the whole rock star thing is so overblown and almost kind of pathetic. Uh, I, I understand why people think you are, but what I don't get is musicians who think they are. Now, I always thought Jake was not, he doesn't seem arrogant or, or rock star-ish or anything. He seems like a pretty... There's uh, no pre no pre pretense to what he does. He is who he is. Um, you know, has he been a rock star and a guitar hero? Yeah. Has it changed him? No. He's exactly the same way he was. Success or not success, whatever. Jake's just like a regular guy. You know, Ray, for the most part, it never affected him either. So, you know, I, I don't think we made enough money to really act like big rock stars. You know what I mean? Sure. What was uh, Ray like to work with? Ray was uh, incredible. He, Ray was the only singer I've ever played with. That no matter how many takes you took in the studio or sound checks, Rehearsals. Even if he didn't have words, he sang every single one. Even if he was just making it up. Ray sang every take we ever did in the studio, every sound check. Ray never missed anything because that's where he had his fun. Ray liked to go out and sing. So, yeah, he, and, and being around Ray, you would be convinced that he was his best friend. Ray was that guy. And so do you guys gig at all beforehand, before getting the record contract, or is it just put the band together and then you get signed? We put the band together and then we went in and did demos. Uh, we looked for management. We talked to a bunch of different managers, and we were actually going to go with Larry Mazur, who at the time managed Cinderella and Kiss. And at the last minute, uh, we ended up going with Paul O'Neill, and uh, who none of us liked. But he made a bunch of promises. Some of them he uh, followed through on them. Some of them he did. But uh, he was part of Lieber and Krebs, or had been part of Lieber and Krebs. So he promised all these different things. Like I said, some of it came to fruition. But none of us ever really cared for him. There was just something about him that, you know, even Ray, who had known him from Lieber and Krebs, he was just kind of a, I hate to speak ill of the dead because he's gone and may right. he rest in peace. 
it was just, uh, there was something about him that made you go, something's not right here. And it ended up, you know, in the end, when we parted company with him, it's because things were not right. When I saw the that he produced you and managed, I thought, that's kind of weird, because I was thinking his only connection at the time, was he doing anything besides the Sabotage stuff at that time? I think Sabotage was the one thing he was doing. You got to remember, on that first Badlands record, the only stuff he produced is the stuff that doesn't sound right. So Jay basically produced that record. What happened is when we went in to mix it, Paul O'Neill behind our back added some triggers to the drums, and we didn't know about it till it was actually mastered, and there was nothing we could do about it. So the snare drums triggered and all that, and none of us, including Eric, wanted that. And um, he buried the, you know, because he changed the drum sound, he buried the bass and some of the stuff. So Jake wasn't really happy with that. So when the next record was going to come out, we already knew that Jake was going to do it by himself and it would be all Jake's sonic ideas as opposed to having Paul O'Neill because he was a record company. Part of the deal that we made with him is he would get to produce our first record. Well, he didn't know anything. So you know, having him produce it, you know, that's like me saying, look, I'll be, I'll, I'll be in the, uh, I'll be in NASA but I want to be able to fly the space shuttle. Like the first time it goes up, I want to fly it. about flying the space shuttle. Right. O'Neill didn't know anything about production. <laughs> right. right. And, and Sabotage is funny. I mean, they just put out, I was always stunned how they kept their contract with Atlantic. I mean, I, I didn't know they were even selling records until like Hall of the Mountain King, you know, but that was a long ride that they took. And then, of course, he went on to do the Trans-Siberian Orchestra and, and uh, huge success with that. But but, but yeah, I just thought that was a strange connection that, you know, you're on a major label. Why don't you get some, uh, like, a big-ass producer? One reason why is because a big-ass producer costs big-ass money. And uh, Paul, uh, you know, he was a necessary evil. Um, we figured that he would get a production credit, but we would basically, we thought that we would be able to override whatever he was doing. And what he did in the end, like I said, there was a time during the mixing process where he kind of changed some stuff to the way he wanted it, which was not the way we wanted it. And by the time it came out, by the time we realized what was going on, the record had already been mastered. We just figured, well, we'll deal with this now. And, you know, I'll... I'll talk to people all the time that say that that's their favorite record of the three and they like the sound of that one better. But I'll also talk to a lot of people that say they like the sound of Voodoo Highway better. Um, the Voodoo Highway record is much more organic. Yeah. And the uh, the first one's kind of slick and it's, dare I say, mildly overproduced. Yeah. I, yeah, you know? yeah, mildly is, I, I think, the word, definitely. Because I, I definitely don't think it was overly produced. Be, uh, compared to uh, a lot of that stuff from the 80s. <laughs> but uh, it's yeah, still we, kind of organic sounding, you know, I, I thought. Uh, I mean, it is for what other people were doing, but it wasn't raw enough for us. We wanted something raw, more earthy, you know, for lack of a better word. And, and part of it is because he mixed the bass out of it. You lose that kind of uh, girth. It's in the dark, you hear the bass, the melody line, and you hear it on some of High Wire and Rumble and Train. But there's other stuff where it's kind of not... Where if you listen to where bass is at on the second record versus the first one, you can hear the difference. So I think that's, I know that's what Jake was missing, obviously I was. And I think that the drum sounds, uh, again, the drums. When I listen to that and I hear Eric snare drum, it's like, that's not what we had in mind. But, and the other thing is when we recorded that record, there's up to 30 takes of some of those songs. Voodoo Highway, there's not one song on there that has more than four takes. And Dusk is all one take. And so why did you do 30 takes of the others? It's what Paul and you wanted. Oh, okay. So he was sitting and, yeah. in there the whole time. Oh, no, he was. And you know, once the basic tracks were done, we, um, we didn't think it was going to sound the way it sounded, regardless of whether we was there or not. We, we thought it was going to sound more raw sounding. Again, it's not a bad sounding record. I'm not saying I don't like it. It's a great record. I like all the songs on it. The performances are outstanding. I'm not putting down the record in any way, shape, or form. I just think that we could have done a better record without Paul O'Neill. If you ever get to talk to Jake, I'm sure he'll concur with me 100%. Where did you record that album? The first half of it was recorded at One on One in LA, and then the second half of it was recorded at the record plant in the uh, New York City. So, uh, High Wire, Dreams in the Dark, uh, I have to think about it, um, Streets Cry Freedom, A Winner's Call were all songs that were recorded in New York, and then like uh, Rumbling Train and uh, Ball and Chain and Devil Stomp, uh, Hard Driver, whatever else, 
was recorded in one on one. And the reason that is because Atlantic decided they hadn't heard a hit out of what we had recorded, so they and had Dick and Ray go to New York to write more songs, and that's where High Rock, High Wire, and Dreams in the Dark were written. And I believe Streets as well. You know, we I didn't do anything on it. I came up with the melodic bass line in it, but um, they decided that Dreams in the Dark, that was going to be our hit, and I think they actually kind of wrote it. The only time we ever wrote something with, let's try to write a radio song. It was a very arduous record to make because we recorded in two different places, and, you know, we got pulled out of the studio. I mean, the coolest thing to me, other than doing the record, was we recorded in the studio in the record plant where Mountain recorded Mississippi Queen, so I thought that was kind of cool. That's very cool. Same board. But I mean, as far as anything else, a lot of that was pretty much a whirlwind you know what i mean right how long did it take to complete it i think we started recording in in la sometime in september and then we went to new york in january i think we recorded for about maybe two months maybe six weeks in la and then we got pulled out uh they went to la wrote around christmas time eric and i came over in january and i think we were done in two or three weeks so probably the whole record took six months which is a long time on our budget but oh, they wanted to get it right and then we went on tour and we were on tour by june of 89 Man. So, yeah 89 do you recall what the budget was for that record i want to say around four hundred thousand. god almighty wow that's incredible yeah, I, think spent, I think we spent every bit of it wow that's incredible, and and so they're just basing that. I'm I'm sure uh, just from Jakey e. Lee, right? Just uh, to get that kind of much. Yeah, man. And so, do you are you part of the record contract? Do you sign the record deal with them? Yeah, I did. Okay, we all did. Do you remember anything about the day that you signed your record contract? Anything stand out? I, no, you know, you would think I would, but nothing in nothing particular. I think the band was in such in such a weird spot from you know changing managers on the fly and, you know, everything else. Uh, it was just kind of a weird sort of time. So I don't, nothing really sticks out like, oh, it's a great moment. I just couldn't tell you about it. Sure. Is there a story to like High Wire or Winter's Call or Dreams in the Dark, any of those songs? Dreams in the Dark was just written, like I said, to be something that the radio would catch on to. Everything else is kind of just comes from Jake's musical imagination. Uh, Ball and Chain, the second song we ever wrote. Uh, actually, the song that starts out the second record last time is the first song we ever wrote. And then, you know, Dancing on the Edge had a different title and different lyrics at one point before it ended up being whatever it's called right now or whatever. It was called Dancing on the Edge. It was called something else before that. Uh, if there's if there's one iconic Badlands song to me, the most iconic Badlands song is uh, High Water. So, I mean, if there's one song that I would say the band is known for, right. as far as even playing it live, it'd be High Wire. We didn't play Dreams in the Dark live very often when the first record first came out. So, you know, High Wire or A Rumbling Train um, would be two of the more iconic songs off that record. Obviously, you would have Winner's Call, which is a great song to play, but we never played it when I was in Red Dragon Cartel, and I don't know if he's ever played it in Red Dragon Cartel. So, to me, if I had to pick two songs off that record that would be definitive Badlands, it would be uh, Rumbling Train and uh, High Wire, which is the side with Red Dragon Cartel when they played here. I went up and played High Wire. Very cool. Do you keep in touch with Eric? No, nope. oh, not okay. at all. That's on his anatomy for something that I didn't do. But Eric's kind of a stubborn guy, so he's decided that he's still going to be mad at me, and I can't control that. I'd like nothing more than to be friends with him, but if he wants to be mad at me, then have at it. Why is he mad at you? It would take too long to go into. It's over something that was said in print that was credited to me that I didn't say. And when I tried to explain to Eric that I didn't say that, he just wasn't going to hear it. Um, I know that uh, we have some mutual friends. He doesn't hold me in high esteem, so whatever. And this is, I'm assuming this is, it sounds like it's after he left the band. Well, we became friends after he left. We didn't get along at all while we were in the band together until the very end. Really? And then after, we didn't like each other at all. I used to flip a coin every week where I'd beat the hell out of Eric and get kicked out of the band or put up with Eric's crap. I, I would annoy him, he would annoy me. And it's not his fault or my fault. We just didn't jive. We just did not get along. He didn't get what I was doing. I didn't care what he was doing. And through that, we managed to make a really great record. And, you know, um, our road manager at the time would come up to me and say, you know, people come to see Badlands to see Jake and Ray. And they go away from Badlands thinking how great Jake and Ray is, but also how great the rhythm section is. He goes, that's a high compliment. So even if we didn't get along, 
um, we played together great. And we eventually were friends, and we got along great. We did my solo record, and he played great on it. I think he's a great drummer. He's actually a really good singer, too. And like I said, he's mad at me, and I can't control <laughs> It's like this, Adam. You want to be mad at me, I can't stop you. I And if Eric wants to be mad at me, I can't stop him. I wish we were friends, but we're not, so whatever. Sure. So I wish him, I wish him the best. He's a big rock star and a millionaire, and I'm a guy that runs a guitar store and, you know, has a good time being a musician. I'm sure he's happy. I'm happy. And I wish him nothing but the best. Eric came up to me. I'd be more than happy to talk to him, but I'm not going to spend one second worrying about it. Great uh, drummer, though. Yeah, man. I, I, I wouldn't have thought that for a second. It, both of you guys seem like you're uh, super laid back cats. So, And then especially a drummer and a bass player, man, who are supposed to lock in with each other. It seems uh, that must have been hell if it would have... Uh, uh, been a pain in the nah, ass. Nah, I like the fact that you said laid back cat, you know, then Eric is the cat, you know, and Kiss. So I, that wasn't lost on me. And the way that we did that record is Eric just played Jay. He didn't spend any time paying attention to me. That's the way he does it anyway. He's more focused on the guitar player. And what I did is I just tailor made my bass parts to go with what he what he was playing. So it wasn't like we sat down and wrote anything out. It's just him playing with Jake and then me figuring out what he was doing and then me playing to it. Do you remember anything about the filming the videos for uh, Dreams in the Dark or Winter's Call? Dreams in the Dark was about 33 hours of just stupidity and misery. We hated it. And, you know, for me, like I said before, I was in the original cut of the video. I was for about three seconds. So they re-edited the video to make me in it more and I complained about uh, so when Paul O'Neill had this video there's a scene where I'm coming down the stairs and those stairs are real bouncy and so that's what they left in there because he would hear that that would upset me and I don't care Winter's Call was a lot different uh, we shot it twice first time we ended up not using the version and then we reshot it out where the one that out where they uh, on a movie set out by uh, Magic Mountain and uh, did it at night in November so it was cold as hell and uh we uh, yeah, ended up doing that second video. So we were going to do a third video when Ray got sick, and so we ended up just moving on to the second record. Oh, but I, okay. like, I like the Winter's Call video better than the Dreams in the Dark one. And so you guys hit the road. Of course, I had just um, uh, talked to, to Mark Kendall, and so I know you toured with um, Tesla, Great White, and then you guys opening. I mean, that must have been a pretty big tour because both those bands were giant at the time, right? Yeah, they are both in their peak. Yeah, we did about, I don't know, four four months with them or something like that. And yeah, it's great. I mean, Mark's a nice guy. Um, I'm still friends with Adi Gasbro, the drummer. Um, I got along good with everybody. They were easy to get along with. They didn't clamp any kind of restrictions on us. I was particularly close with uh, Brian Wheat from Tesla. I'm still good friends with Frank Hannon. And I was good friends with Troy Luketa. As a matter of fact, I used to kind of hang around with them. Uh, Brian Wheat and I would hang out and talk about Zeppelin stuff. And he would... He would uh, ask me about Zeppelin bass lines, and I would show him different Zeppelin bass lines, and he would show me different things that he was doing. So, yeah, it was a, it was a fun tour and uh, no issues at all. You know, no, no, uh, no drama. Was that just in the States? Yeah, and they were actually on their second or third go-around in a lot of these cities, so they were pretty big to be playing at some of these places for two or three times. The one thing about both those bands that was different than Badlands, they had very low stage volume, and everything was coming out of the PA, and Badlands had extreme stage volume, <laughs> and it was coming out of the PA. So yeah. we would sound check those guys, go, oh, God, we wish we could have our amps that loud, but they won't let us. Oh, please, we're, we're turning up. Mark said that uh, Jake's amps were unreal. It that, is. That Ray even had commented to him that he could sleep next to Mark's amp because yeah. he's so used to Well, you, to could, Jake's. You, could, you could carry on a conversation. We could have this conversation on stage while they were playing live, whether it was Great White or Tesla. You could actually have this conversation. Wow. And here he could be fine. And Ben would roll out there at about 128, 132 dB. And I mean, it would be just friggin' loud. I had... I mean, I had six bass cabinets on stage. I was only coming out of two of them, and it was so loud. Jake was coming out of just, like, two cabinets, even though he had six on stage. 
It was so freaking loud. I mean, pretty pretty much Jake's amp is dime the whole time. It's on 10. The way a Marshall sounds good anyway. And then I'd have my bass amp, which was I had two 300-watt bass amp basically tied together. So I'd have a, maybe a thousand, uh, two 500-watt bass amp. So I had a 1,000 watts of bass coming off stage. And, I mean, it was so loud that it would make your pants shake. I mean, it was freaking, and I loved it. That's the only way I can play. If it's not loud, I don't even want to do it. That album sold 400000 which I'm assuming, I mean, it should be gold by now, right? No, it's not released, so it sold about 480000 480000 and then they just put it out of print and never put it in print again, huh? Well, there's a bunch of... I know some of the little like side that. companies, but I thought those were... He got in big trouble for that. Who did? The guy that released the CD. Oh, yeah? Getting permission. Yeah, Atlantic shut him down. It's amazing that Atlantic wouldn't license that out and let somebody re-release it. Yeah, well, without going into the stories on it, there because it's very well documented, there's a, a whole bunch of crap regarding that, and I don't want to go into it. It's regard Ray's health. You, if you look it up, you can find it. First record, you know, I... I don't think Atlantic wants to re-release it for many reasons, but one of the reasons is I don't think they want us to have a gold record. We did everything in our power to make Atlantic miserable, not on purpose, just because we wouldn't go along with the program. You know, we wouldn't do what they wanted. That's not the way Jake operated. That's not the way I operate, which is one of the reasons Jake and I got along so well. We didn't think the Atlantic, that the record company should dictate on how we did our business. And the second record sold over 400,000 copies, and that one went gold in Japan. I never even got my gold record from it. Mm-hmm. first one went gold in Japan, and I got a gold record from it. I mean, I wouldn't mind if they re-released that stuff. I wouldn't mind having a couple gold records pass on to my kids. And people love that record. I mean, they should uh, definitely do a remaster. Maybe someday, but I don't seen it. I haven't seen anything that tells me that that is. <laughs> 